Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Hydrogen might be one of the most important commodities of this century, and trading hydrogen is expected to start this decade. Many companies are already actively investigating from exchanges through to traders. Today, we're going to discuss the route map to getting to a traded hydrogen market. Joining us to discuss today is Eric Raku. Eric is a senior manager at Beringa, the management consultancy, and for the last five years has been focused on energy transition and in particular clean hydrogen, and has a 20-year career in strategy and regulation. Eric, thanks for joining us. Great to be here, Bob. Before we start, I guess, on the, the route map to getting to a traded hydrogen market, could you help orientate us? Why is there such interest in hydrogen uh, why is this going to be a growth area? And can you also help navigate some, for us some of the terminology around these, <laughs> the color system? It all, to me, starts in uh, Paris. So through Paris agreements and the Paris alignment, we see that is a tremendous drive across industry, financiers, utilities, a lot of players basically who are now using fossil fuels to decarbonize. And the main drivers, they're all looking for the magic wand that will help to decarbonize, but also to find something for the hard to abate sectors like transportation, steel, shipping. And what you then see is that hydrogen has those magic qualities if you're able to produce it cleanly and affordably. So that's really the drive for clean hydrogen through the decarbonization and through the hard to abate sector solution as an energy carrier. So on your other question, like, you know, what sorts of hydrogen are there? Um, it, it, there is this amazing color uh, debate that we see. Uh, so there are there's blue hydrogen, there is green hydrogen, there is turquoise hydrogen. So those are at least the three I, I, I would be keen to explain. So blue hydrogen is when you produce hydrogen out of natural gas, typically using steam and methane reforming. And then you're also in the process, you, you capture carbon, uh, which comes through, uh, through the production. And this delivers basically what we call blue hydrogen. So hydrogen with carbon captured. That technology is available right now. The steam methane reforming is already happening. That's what we call, you know, gray hydrogen. That's an existing multi-billion industry. Uh, where, which, where we produce hydrogen using steam methane reforming, and we call it grey hydrogen. So the only kind of add-on, which is a bit still exciting and to be proven at scale, is the carbon capture storage. So um, we do have, for example, in Europe, uh, projects in uh, Norway, like Northern Lights, or uh, projects in the uh, Netherlands, but also in UK, to test it out. But it's not yet, at least in Europe, proven at scale. Of course, there is also globally carbon capture storage projects. United States is also uh, a leader in this area. But it's not yet a massively wide solution. So the combination of large-scale blue hydrogen is to be shown. So then maybe to continue on to the green uh, so green hydrogen is basically a hydrogen producer, electrolyzes of water uh, using renewable power. And typically that renewable power is either hydropower, wind power, or solar power. So green hydrogen is, for example, something that Europe is going for. So there is a European strategy uh, which uh, really predicts large amounts of green hydrogen to be produced in the next 10, 20 years. And we already see uh, the follow on rollout of national strategies across Europe, uh, which basically uh, supports that strategy. So green hydrogen, renewable power produced hydrogen is another color to remember. And that's the Nirvana like state, right? That's the you using renewable power to create a either a fuel um, that can go back into generation, i.e. acting as some you know, storage and solving intermittency for some of these renewable power sources, or you know, itself becomes a fuel that can be used in transportation. That, that really is kind of, and I guess we'll come on to the, some of the challenges there, but that really is the, as you say, the, 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 what's getting everyone really excited about hydrogen. I like your word uh, Nirvana because I'm also a music fan. 
but um it it, it is um it is a bit of a nirvana state and it if we are able globally i would say to get abundance of green hydrogen and particularly affordably produced and perhaps also traded it's not going to be easy and it will come to it but yes it would be an amazing um something and i must say some of our clients are working towards that and we do see initiatives across uh, for example in australia but also in europe where we are working where this is you know people really building starting to build that well nirvana dream uh, so it's perhaps not no longer necessarily a dream it is a it is on the way of scaling um to go back just to one more of the you know magical ones one is a bit under the radar but i'm quite interested to follow as well is the uh, turquoise hydrogen so that's a technology for example uh gasprom but also uh, 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 BIS are looking at. It is in research stage, but uh, what that would mean is that you take natural gas and you use pyrolysis, where under high temperatures, you're able to split natural gas into um, hydrogen on one side and black carbon on the other side. And black carbon is something you can, for example, put in tires, so you actually create a product instead of uh, carbon. So it is, in a way, you could argue a subset of blue hydrogen, but it doesn't have the challenges that it brings to store carbon, for example, underground. So that's a very, I, I find also a very interesting direction to watch. Yeah. So we should say, you know, irrespective, hydrogen is hydrogen the provenance of that hydrogen is where there will be some price differential in terms of, you know, we'll come on to that, um, you know, how it's certified and obviously its sustainability factors. Hydrogen is hydrogen, though. We're trying to map out a route to where we get to a vibrant global traded hydrogen market, much like we have in oil or natural gas LNG. You've mapped out, for the purposes of this discussion, seven steps to get to that. Your first one is, I guess, the most crucial in many ways is actually the infrastructure actually starting to produce and consume hydrogen. Um, can you talk a little bit about kind of where we are right now and where you think we need to get to? Absolutely. So um, I will be uh, often using uh, the examples uh, in Europe, but uh, obviously uh, there are also some quite interesting examples I find in Japan, in Australia and United States. So. I will start with infrastructure uh, from the seven steps. And to give an overview, the seven steps we will cover, it will concern infrastructure, market structure, policy regulatory framework, financial backing and platforms, product design, scaling and enabling by technology, and to talk about sponsors and first movers. So now first on infrastructure. So what, what I see is that that's a very critical piece. You you need sufficient transport capacity, and you also need to think about storage. You need effective third-party access so that you can very much like the traded gas markets developed, you are able to get into the grid, get with your hydrogen across, for example, Europe, and uh, trade it. And for that, you probably also need independent grid operators that will be working to facilitate that future market and building and constructing additional infrastructure as the market grows. As we move from what we see now, clusters of activity, if you look to the map of Europe and you kind of look to, to it today, then probably you, you, you will notice quite a bit of activity in the Netherlands, in UK, in Germany, and emerging activities also in countries like Spain and Portugal, and uh, Italy is also starting to come on the map, but it all it's all really clusters. So what we then see is our development of the European backbone now being planned in the next five to 10 years. Once that is able to connect those clusters of hydrogen activity, and there is also storage solutions connected to it, for example, using salt caverns in the places where that's a um, geologically feasible, you're suddenly starting to have a market very much like we have for uh, gas markets right now. And that could be really amazing. So infrastructure, that's 
definitely one to watch. And that's one also already starting to happen in the next five to 10 years. And as I understand it, one of the attractions of hydrogen to kind of all the participants in this energy mix is that it, it's got something for everyone. It, it can lean on existing infrastructure or lean into, whether that's gas pipelines, whether that's even um, it being converted into liquid ammonia to be transported. It's not an entirely new set of infrastructure that's required, um, like it would be if we were to solely go to an electron solution in the future. Yeah, interesting you're mentioning those two elements. Well, first to start with the link of um, electrons, I think one interesting element is how will we plan, and if we take Europe in particular, the interaction between power grid and the clean hydrogen grid? Because uh, in some cases, perhaps it will be more beneficial directly to transport green power through the power grid. And in many other cases, because of the... Uh, energy density of uh, um, you may better and because of the storage you may better choose clean hydrogen to be transported so i think you'll see both so that was a ver very interesting element you mentioned there in your question with, which i uh, fully support then onto the existing infrastructure use uh, there is clearly benefits in using what some people estimate as you know close to well let's say three, three digits, billions worth of gas infrastructure in Europe, it is probably very wise to look at how we can reuse some of that. So there is a lot of pilots going on by various gas grid operators in Europe. Uh, there is definitely what we are also hearing from some of the clients think of repurposing, preparing for that, thinking about how you can use, for example, one of the legs of your infrastructure so not the complete natural gas network uh, to transfer. Uh, I mean, there are issues, right? So you do need to think about what it does if you're using steel, uh, what it does to to your pipe if you put hydrogen in. Uh, is there a risk of embrittlement? You need to look at the valves because hydrogen is a very escapable gas. So it's much more escapable, let's say, than natural gas. You need to look in the compression stations. You need to look in metering. And there is all this work going on to address those issues by the gas grid operators, uh, firms like uh, Open Grid Europe, Gas Uni, National Grid are looking at it as we speak. But not necessarily, I guess, new problems for the oil and gas production and transportation industry, right? Still relatively familiar in terms of working with pipelines and so on. Absolutely. And there is, of course, existing uh, networks as well. So there is definite, I mean, uh, transporting uh, hydrogen is not new. Companies like Alikida, Linda Air Products already do that, for example, very uh, quite a large scale, but as an industrial gas in their area, uh, Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, so where the industrial uh, clusters are connected. But what is now new is bringing it to a very large scale, but also repurposing the natural gas pipelines. That is something that we need to test at large scale. So the second step you talk is is market structure, right? I, I guess ultimately you, you mean by that, or I think you, I understand by that is you've got to have excess capacity and, and demand out there that, that leads to this just not being bilateral long-term agreements between two parties, right? You're onto there. Let me give a bit more detail on that. So it is indeed about you know a need for a marketplace. You know, is there a need? Because if there is just long-term contracts and everybody is fine, like it used to be with natural gas markets many years ago, then you don't really need to trade. But if you have a need for a marketplace and you have a diversity of buyers and sellers with uh, differing needs, some of them will have surplus, some of them will have shortages. You also need a sizable market, right? So you need a bit of a materiality. So that's why also infrastructure is quite important because maybe some markets will have quite a small need for clean hydrogen. But if you combine, for example, markets regionally, you do suddenly have a bit of a surplus shortage and a need for trade. So materiality of that the emerging uh, demand uh, of, of clean hydrogen is also quite important. So early on thinking how you can link up 
use cases, which will then also have various needs and eventually that will need to trading. You know, imagine a situation where, uh, and those are, you know, real things happening, but so imagine a port of Rotterdam that's now working on a thousand trucks uh, to be fueled there. They're also thinking about shipping. Then imagine uh, the the thousand truck project Hydrospot in Switzerland. Imagine uh, clean steel uh, projects uh, emerging in Germany. Imagine that all being actually connected through a European backbone. Suddenly, you because those are different use cases with different patterns of use. Suddenly, you see uh, you don't need much imagination to see that there will be a need to trade. And that is what you need, diversity of buys and sellers. There are also some other things you need if you think about market structure. You need a suitable point of trade. So the infrastructure operators will need to create a set of rules that allow an agreed point of trade. You need a standardized contract, uh, very much similar to what we have now, for example, for natural gas, where you have standardized OTC contracts, you have an exchange trade, and uh, you will probably still also have long-term deals. And I mean, in one of our global projects, we see, for example, be- people looking at you know purchase agreements, uh, say five to ten years type of agreements, uh, which is not unlike the long-term contracts for per power and gas. But you will also have the need for trade as we see it. You've mentioned it a couple of times for the benefit of, I guess, me. What is, you you mentioned the European backbone. Can you just quickly give us a description of that? A number of uh, European gas grid operators have presented a plan uh, for European backbone where they convert existing gas networks to a clean hydrogen network. And they have uh, estimated, well, close to 60 billion euro investment needed to make that happen. They've also made very clear that even though it's just a a set of gas grid operators in Europe, they're very open to all other grid operators and stakeholders joining that project. I think the main challenge of that project is that now, and that will lead us soon to the third point, we, we would need a clear policy and regulatory framework to see how that physical backbone which is feasible to construct and to repurpose, will function market-wise? What will be the rules of the game? Are, for example, gas grid operators as part of that backbone allowed to own and operate an electrolyzer? Are they to let on that backbone uh, turquoise hydrogen, for example, coming from Russia or uh, coming from some other place? Will they allow blue hydrogen? Will they only want green hydrogen on the backbone? How? What is the traded place on that on that uh, backbone? So I, I I'm I think uh, backbone is a really exciting project, but what I'm even more excited about and what I think it would need is clear set of rules, and and that's really uh, very important for that project. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Then I guess that's your third point there, isn't it? That we do need this policy and regulatory framework because from a very prosaic example, you know, as I can understand it, if you've got, yeah, hydrogen is hydrogen, it's only about its provenance that in in many ways matters in some cases. How do you um, allow for that on the pipelines? A lot of this comes down to certification. Can you just, I guess, expand a little bit on on that aspect? And, and, you know, and, and I guess this market, this growing marketplace, this growing infrastructure will start forcing, I assume, relatively quickly, some policy and regulatory frameworks. How far have we got on, on that journey as well? Thank you. So let me first start with um, uh, the kind of general rules and then move to certification. Uh, so what I see is the policy um, and regulatory framework need. The third point is... You really need third-party access to that future grid that will connect up the clusters of hydrogen. You also need to think about how their hydrogen storage will be regulated. So imagine there are salt currents uh, full of hydrogen. You know, will parties be able to book that capacity in the future, similar to what you can do now with natural gas storage? Uh, Imagine the uh, shipping of hydrogen will be commonplace, and even if we ship it either as liquid hydrogen or as ammonia, um, will we 
regulate access to to terminals uh we we need to think about those things in advance before people are able to put down investments so third party access framework is really important to consider and it was good news recently to hear that european commission at least in europe is considering to put forward a set of rules around summer next year uh for consultation and discussion so uh, very much looking forward to, uh, to that uh, that will be i think very exciting and very much uh, uh, determining uh, uh, how the investment may, may may scale sooner or slower. Another element, if you think about policy and regulatory framework, is really about uh, um, is really the fact that there's stable in institutional framework and enabling market rules and transparency addressed, and there are no barriers to trade. So you need to kind of think about the whole system. Um, for example, uh, I would expect that uh, once clean hydrogen becomes a large traded commodity, you know, similar rules that apply now to trading power and to trading natural gas would apply. And one just needs to make sure uh, trading hydrogen is not more difficult than trading power or natural gas right now. And then to the certification. Right. That again, I wanted to finish with that topic because that's very important and probably the first one that you know way to start trading hydrogen will actually be to start trading gar guarantees of origin because um, uh, depending on how that system would be organised, um, you would expect that uh, buyers will demand uh, to understand if they are buying hydrogen how it has been produced because indeed there is no sticker on it. So it will be quite important that there will be uh, ways emerging to, uh, ideally globally, to certify how hydrogen has been produced. So that's also quite important. And um, and I, I'm expecting that at least in Europe we may see initially a market for guarantees of origin of of clean hydrogen emerging, very much like we now see traded markets uh, for guarantees of origin of, of biogas. So I think it's a fascinating point about certification because that kind of aligns with your next point about financial backing. And obviously for this traded market to get financial backing and just support more broadly, that certification process needs to be, you know, beyond the the broader mechanics of it being a profitably traded, you know, a traded market and it, it being a, a viable uh, product itself. Getting that certification piece is so critical because there's no sticker on the hydrogen itself, as you, as you eloquently put. It seems to me that that really is where perhaps technology currently is also enabling markets to tackle some of this challenge around transparency, tracking, certification, when you start adding sustainability attributes to them. And the same thing's happening in steel and metals and more broadly, you know, electricity, of course. We do have now these shared ledgers, blockchain, these platforms, which might, I think, make the better connectivity between the, the product and some of the financial backers and institutions that will be needed, you know, your fourth point, um, to be able to actually sort of invest in this space. So I think financial backing and, and platforms are really uh, important points to think through. What I also find interesting, because clean hydrogen market doesn't yet exist globally or in Europe, um, it, it's probably an opportunity to indeed use uh, new solutions because we're not bothered by by their uh, cost of switching from existing solutions. So it will be interesting to see how people jump on that opportunity, indeed using also latest technologies. I think, I, I think that, you know, but at the end, you know, critical mass, mass of traders and, you know, act perhaps linking to existing solutions like we know that in trading, in Europe, for example, Trayport uh, solution is a very wide one. So kind of working with and linking to certain existing tools uh, for traders, I, I, I'm guessing will be uh, quite important. But similar to natural gas trade again, and I think there is quite a bit of similarity there, what you will watch out for is a reliable platform, reputable with counterparty credit risk, Managed to at least the sinister to be managed, so you can pick the parties you trade with. And I think we already see uh, people jumping on it, even though um, there is obviously not immediately now 
surpluses or shortages of hydrogen to trade. But what you saw is, for example, Port of Rotterdam launching an initiative uh, to start exploring uh, a global clean hydrogen exchange setup. And I thought that was really interesting. I thought also related to that, if you kind of see that pricing agencies like Platts were very big in uh, in oil, uh, also since uh, early this year started producing uh, price indexes uh, based in Netherlands, based in United States, and also uh, Japan. Uh, that's also really interesting. And I understood they have more on their roadmap. So I think it's really interesting to see that parties are already preparing for the age of traded hydrogen. Mm, mm. And I think that we'll probably talk about this at the end, but it sounds like all these potential participants in the future need to be talking about it and engage in these discussions right now because they're going on. You know, people are starting to design these markets uh, with or without you, so to speak. Just going, keeping on certification, the fundamental driver of difference in value between hydrogens will be whether it's green or blue or turquoise in its provenance and that that spread even at the moment as i understand it's you know uh, is 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 significant it's a couple of dollars a a ton it strikes me that uh without that there's just such a capacity for bad actors to be able to get gray hydrogen into the system uh, or rebadge hydrogens that it seems that piece of reassuring the market around the the hydrogen itself is going to be just so critical. I, I guess it's, it strikes me that that's worth some emphasis. It is absolutely worth it. And uh, indeed, uh, differences of a couple of dollars, if not more, per kilogram uh, of hydrogen uh, can be observed now, which would, would need to be bridged, for example, either through uh, government incentives or carbon pricing. Um, and I think uh, in that sense, uh, uh, you could almost argue in that at least a personal view that uh, carbon pricing is also an issue very much linked to the rise of clean hydrogen trading and price differentials. So I, I can very much imagine that there will be a large correlation between uh, pricing of carbon in various geographies and the way um, certified hydrogen of various quality produced, being it blue, green, uh, but also versus grey, uh, will be priced. Mm. And, and that brings us, I guess, your next point, the, uh, the the fifth, is is around that product design and the contracts out there, the nature of those contracts. And this I find quite a fascinating discussion because we're already seeing this um, to some extent in other commodities where there's a bit of a debate going on about whether the contracts themselves need to bake in these sustainability factors, which often are hidden, right? Because they're about how they were manufactured or some hidden attributes. Does the con- contract account for that? Um, or actually, is the contract the contract and, and the participants will add a premium or, or discount depending on these other factors, as long as they're certified? I guess your point is that there's going to be a myriad of contracts needed out there from options all the way through just to mirror what we've got in the natural gas and oil markets. Absolutely. But also perhaps because uh, there is also a link because of green hydrogen to power markets, also perhaps some elements from power markets. But I would agree that it's probably... So spark spreads, for example, that kind of type. Absolutely. Of but, but it could be much closer to natural gas is, is, is my current assumption. So I think the question we need to start thinking through, what will be the contract options and structures? And, and my sense is just because of the risk is people will start with uh, at least volume and uh, wise with smaller products to trade. So like we would have seen that if trading emerged, people would have started, let's say, with day ahead a monthly contract somehow, uh, rather than immediately j- jumping to uh, more longevity. So simply by the fact that the credit risk, for example, on our smaller uh, ticket size would be smaller. Maybe to also talk about what is what else is there in product design. I think it really depends on healthy dialogue and feedback with market participants. Uh, so I think it will be really key that, for example, initiative like uh, Port of Rotterdam, but also perhaps other initiatives where they will start looking at trading uh, hydrogen. Uh, they do engage with market participants uh, who are already looking to it. Uh, the ones who are also 
busy setting up projects and clusters across the geographies, it will be key to think what is it that they need to trade their risk. Yeah. So do you expect to see the major exchanges, like you've already mentioned, Platts, start to develop these um, short-term contracts, you know, um, you know, and then we'll go from there? Or do you think there'll be a, a, another body that starts to develop these? You know, who, who's going to start putting these contracts out? And are, is the market even ready for them right now? I would expect that, uh, <laughs> I think, ma- ma- the, uh, whoever comes with uh, with solutions should at least aim to have solutions uh, in the next two, three years, because you do see clean hydrogen projects across Europe moving to going live, let's say, by 2023, 2025, at least in Europe. And uh, at least from what, what I can see from talking to various uh, investors, but also utilities that are, uh, as we speak, busy with projects, uh, there will be projects uh, live, you know, in the time frame 2023, 2025. And, and those projects uh, would benefit uh, from uh, some form of uh, at least uh, guarantees of origin of hydrogen trading. That I can very much see. So I would be, I, I would almost advise if, <laughs> if the existing exchanges um, uh, were not looking at it next to uh, Port of Rotterdam initiative, then they should be looking at it. And uh, I'm, I'm aware that at least one of our clients uh, with whom we work is uh, looking kind of uh, globally to uh, to the question of supporting energy exchanges. And yeah, it's uh, they they definitely also have the word hydrogen in in, in, in on their list. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see each major. Uh, exchange currently active in natural gas and oil trading, but also power trading to have a consideration how to help the community, the trading community to start trading in clean hydrogen. Yeah. So I guess this is almost the biggest question out there is, is really, this all comes down to scale. Um, and as I understand from our discussions and from others, you've got obviously these two big buckets of consumption. You've got transportation, so really how prevalent the prevalence of the hydrogen fuel sale in trucks, cars, you know, tr- you know whatever trains, whatever it might be. Um, and then the other one is really on the generation side, and really to do with production and getting electrolysis from the, as you put it to me, the megawatt scale to the gigawatt scale. Can you help us understand kind of not only kind of where we are right now, but what scale we need to get to in both those and, and, and some of the timelines involved? If we want to reach material scale, we do need to move away from, say, you know, 10, 20 megawatts green hydrogen pro- projects to 100, 201 gigawatt scale projects. And they're all on the European roadmap as an example. And I think Europe is quite leading in that. I would say Australia is also very advanced in this area, working together also with South Korea and uh, with Japan. Those are probably two global geographies I would uh, I would put first, both Europe and Australia, um, in combination with Japan. Um, I think we need to show that technological risk can be managed and and there is work in this area and people do invest in projects. And I think there is also a role for government there initially backing those projects with solutions like contract for differences, like we've seen it in offshore wind. And I mean, I'm very encouraged to think back that uh, uh, 10 years ago, offshore wind was actually megawatt scale. And now we across the world, we are constructing offshore wind in gigawatt scales. And that took us 10 years. And initially, it was very difficult to to finance offshore wind, and now uh, there is a great interest, and and one can get project financing because but scaling also very much links to then financial community being to step in and to support those projects next to firms who finance it with their own balance sheets. And I think OEMs so or technology providers have a large role in this, and uh, uh, parties like uh, Siemens. For example, I can see them playing a large role going forward uh, in in helping uh, getting this 
scaled. And I think we really need to show it can work not just at 20 megawatt scale, which we see now, but also at 100 megawatt scale, say by 2025, and at one gigawatt scale type of project starting 2030 onwards. So I think if we're being realistic, the scale where we'll start really see some trading is at the earliest, early 2030s. But in order to to be there, to be active, to uh, to uh, to achieve interesting returns, I think you need to start now. So yeah, the the fully traded market, or at least around this generation piece, early 30s. But you know, yeah, it's a you had to be engaged in the process right now to be able to participate when it when we get to it. W- what about the transportation side? Because that seems to me that could come earlier. Yeah, sure. So the use case, if we think about like uh, how the scaling will will happen and where, so there is of course this supply side of hydrogen, and then there is the uh, transmission and distribution in between and storage, and then we get to the use cases. And there are quite many use cases. And if you think about how the projects across Europe are proceeding, and let me just pick three industries, right? So let me take uh, steel. Uh, heavy duty transport and shipping. So, for example, in in steel, we see quite active. For example, a company like uh, Thyssen Group uh, in a in a in a large uh, project over 100 megawatt and more, looking at uh, which I would say, you know, okay, let's uh, let's assume it will reach its uh, fruition uh, mid 2020s. Uh, then we see, for example, also a very interesting green steel projects in Sweden. Again, that I would say going live and, you know, getting larger scale between 2025, 2030, uh, also based on public data, we can see. Um, so that's green steel, right? The, so the numbers we are seeing to so kind of any materiality in that use case between 2025, 2030. If we look then to have it duty transport, the example you mentioned, another use case, uh, we see a very interesting project in Switzerland, Hydra Spider, you know, first trucks on the road now. Uh, but you know they're aiming to go to 1,000 trucks type of scale in the next few years. Again, I, I would say you know the earliest kind of we see bit of scale is mid 2020s, and then uh, obviously such projects are starting to be discoverable on the European map. For example, also in uh, Netherlands, Port of Rotterdam also has now a, a 1,000 truck plus uh, plan. So again, I would estimate based on experience in Switzerland the ecosystem, that will take some time. So we're we're looking at, I, I think, also, again, mid-2020s. So that's kind of from that use case where we see start seeing some kind of scale and use. If we then think about shipping, shipping I find very fascinating because, you know, it's, a, it's an industry that uh, we depend on for 90% of our global trade, and it's responsible for uh, 3% or so of global emissions. So it's quite substantial industry. Um, and uh, right now, it's uh, a lot of oil is being used to fuel that. But fortunately, there are quite strict regulations coming from IMO, also from European Union, um, and also from, uh, very interestingly, from uh, from from those who uh, transport by ship uh, uh, and also those who finance shipping. So there is a sea cargo charter, there is a Poseidon principles. So it's a very interesting mix of financing pressure of their end users, clients pressure from the regulatory pressure. I think will make that uh, the shipping industry may actually start considering hydrogen as a, as a fuel um, uh, also from mid 2020s. Because if you think about the 2050 target for reducing uh emissions uh and you think that ships have an asset life of 20 25 years it actually becomes quite logical that all the big decisions will be made by around 2025 in shipping and if that happens we suddenly see could see uh, an amazing scale particularly if if hydrogen becomes the fuel of choice i mean there are other choices right so you have biofuels you have their uh, lng uh, also as a solution, but of course, then it depends on how you net the carbon from that. And and you see also electric solutions for shorter distances. 
So hydrogen does have competition, but again, as an uh, and and the same goes for trucking, heavy duty transport, and the same goes for uh, the use cases uh, we we discussed in uh, uh, in other sectors. So hydrogen is not alone. <laughs> Yeah, it's probably a good um, opportunity to sort of restate, though, that, the, that there is, of course, competition. But what hydrogen does that none of the others do to, you know, is, is, is be a more complete solution for solving air quality and solving climate, climate change and other forms of environmental degradation in the sense that, you know, uh, air quality, the, the, the byproduct is, is water or whatever it may be. Um, and you've also got this... Um, you know, so it, it, it is decarbonized. Um, and you've got this issue with batteries on the electric side where the batteries themselves contain components that themselves are polluting, toxics, uh, toxic, and also come from regions of the world where you can't necessarily guarantee um, the same standards of, you know, of production. So there, there are some real key drivers that mean hydrogen ticks a lot of boxes um, on the ESG front, also ticks a lot of boxes for existing participants in the market. This is, you know, it leans on existing infrastructure. It can, it's a good consumer of oil and gas production, potentially for blue and turquoise hydrogen, which I guess brings me to your seventh point, which is ultimately all this comes about through sponsors. You've mentioned, you know, how quickly that can accelerate on the shipping side. And, and frankly, now is the time if we're talking about 2025, when this thing starts to really pick up. Is there an appetite out there? Who are these sponsors? Is there going to be a first mover advantage? Great question. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled by the honor of answering it. Um, because um, um, <laughs> essentially, you're asking me to pick winners, which is something. Uh, <laughs> well, let's go by let's go by industry rather than company names. I think. For the yeah, sake, yeah, yeah. I was also saying, I, 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 I was thinking in the same direction. So, I, I, and I, w I would, um, if I, if I had to, uh, kind of, uh, just based on current known, publicly known state of play. Uh, look at their first movers. Um, I can see, uh, and you know, imagine Europe, uh, you would need to kind of uh, cover uh, the countries heavily green, which are like really advancing fastest, I would say. I would definitely cover uh, Netherlands, Germany, uh, United Kingdom, Denmark, Spain, and Portugal. And and a bit later, because it seems that some of their projects are slightly delayed, uh, I would also cover Italy uh, heavily on the map, uh, at least by 2030s. Um, there is also very promising development in France. Um, those are the geographies I would have in mind. Of course, there are also very interesting things happening in uh, Norway and Sweden. And, it, and interestingly, all these countries you see uh, different use cases kind of more leading uh, the way. And it has a lot to do with what is there right now, right? So is there, for example, a strong existing uh, natural gas industry? Is there a strong industrial clusters? Is there perhaps uh, a surplus of offshore wind that is foreseen? Is there a sur surplus of solar energy? Is there a surplus of hydro energy? Uh, you see some of these elements that actually you can, you know, almost start recognizing you could be the winners. Same goes globally, for example, for Australia. I mean, there is clearly very interesting opportunities, uh, both because of Australia being an a important gas market, but also uh, because of Australia's uh, geographical position towards uh, uh, countries like Japan, uh, but also because of the renewable resources. So. There are some really interesting geographical examples to watch. But are you seeing, I guess, you know, you, you are, you know, heading Beringa's effort to, or, or, you know, are heavily engaged at this point in, in the clean hydrogen market. Are you seeing a sense of urgency from um, oil and gas producers, from, from utilities, from shippers to get engaged and to see this because they do recognize a first mover advantage or as in some industries, sometimes it's best to come second? <laughs> well, there, uh, to start with, um, uh, since uh, I was actually hoping uh, or hoping, I was uh, I was fearing that I I, I would 
have to take a small leave to kind of enjoy and write maybe another book, maybe about hydrogen uh, this autumn, but the phone hasn't stopped ringing. So we've been getting uh, a tremendous amount of requests, particularly to educate um, clients about, you know, what's happening in hydrogen. So I had a lot of conversation with financial players, with uh, utilities, with uh, network operators, also with some uh, technology providers, and also now increasingly with uh, the end users, I guess the industrial players. So you see interest coming from quite a lot of corners. There are also those who uh, look to it from trading perspective. Uh, so definitely there is, there is an amazing interest in this. And I think there is a sense that people at least want to understand Right. So I think the kind of no lose is to make sure is that your organization is trained. I mean, I just, uh, you know, uh, last week I uh, shipped an offer to uh, a number of clients to uh, provide education about use cases of hydrogen because they just want that their organization understands what's what's happening, what's there uh, to be prepared and to, to think about it. And I think education is the minimum. What you also see is that parties very seriously think about where globally uh, should, or perhaps, you know, in Europe, should I build my electrolyzers? You know, there are some choices to be made and you need to think about, think about the power system that is there. You need to understand the gas system. Uh, you need to think about what's the policy environment. There are also people who think, okay, Europe will not be able to, to meet the need for green hydrogen itself and you know perhaps uh should we should we try to help it and without kind of mentioning the geography of particular clients i think it's fair to say there is definitely an interest to consider how to make sure that hydrogen could come uh, to europe globally uh, to help the equation so there is some really interesting things happening amazing time yeah and i think i'd actually i'm going to add a cheekily add an eighth to your to your seven i mean um the, <laughs> the pulse uh pulse eight yeah Excellent. exactly well like and, and and close to my heart is um is talent right you know it's it's you know you've got to if we're going to have a fully trading market there has to be traders there have to be risk managers there has to be all of that the the human infrastructure around that market and it is interesting right because it's it might not necessarily take new new skills, so to speak. It, it seems to me that the market can draw on, depending on which aspect of hydrogen we're talking about, whether it's gas traders, you know, for inland transportation, um, you know, on pipelines, it's oil traders taking over that ammonia piece. Um, you've obviously got um, traders sat around power stations, generation, you know, handling that piece. But it's, you know, it's going to be interesting to see who starts to think about which of their current teams are going to be focused on this and indeed you know training up for some of these nuances and i think you know um particularly around the certification piece and you know tracking and you know certifying and so forth any thoughts there is is it fair to say that with organizations can lean on existing traders traders or do you think there's going to be a a new brand of hydrogen trader needed to be developed one of my European friends, and I think when he will listen to this um, uh, podcast, he will um, he will know um, that it's him. Who I mean, um, he always likes to start his uh, his public appearances, which I have occasionally had pleasure to moderate, by reminding that there, you know, he started out his life as a coal trader, and now basically moved to become a natural gas trader and a power trader expert, etc. So I think uh, trading is the expertise you need to have. I think the uh, sector specifics is something you can learn. Um, so yeah, with this anecdote, uh, I hope I answer your question. Yeah, you know, I think you have, and you know, I'll have a good guess who that is um, after we finish. But um, <laughs> the, the, I think the, you know, the fundamental point though that I've taken away from this, and thank you, it's been really fascinating. Is even though it might take a decade for this market to get up and running, even in a nascent form in trading, it sounds like organizations from across the spectrum, whether you're a producer, a consumer in industrials or a generator or a trading house, you need to, it behooves you to start being present and relevant in the conversations on market design and structure so that you can prepare 
for what might be quite an enormous shift in our energy mix relatively soon. Absolutely. I think I think uh, if people haven't yet started thinking about uh, uh, clean hydrogen, um, well, it's a pity, but it will be a business opportunity missed. Yeah. Well, it's been a real pleasure, Eric, to to, to have you um, on the on the show. Um, really enjoyed the you you taking us on that journey. Um, I should mention quickly that I know Beringa are going to be producing a podcast pretty soon. So, in the in the spirit of podcasters, I will uh, um, hope our listeners listen out for that too. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for joining us. Absolutely, and indeed, uh, Beringa Energy Innovation Podcast is uh, is even already out now. So. It would be a pleasure uh, to to have listeners there as well. And it would be also a pleasure if people have questions, just do reach out to me on LinkedIn. And uh, I'm always open uh, for a great question. Great stuff. Well, Eric, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider, and Human Capital, a search firm dedicated to the commodities sector, go to www.hcinsider.global, where you'll find more original content on the commodities sector and more details on our offerings as a search firm and our locations around the world. Thanks again for listening.